you all for coming. Um, for our talk today, looking really at the security implications of climate change and um, the potential for climate change impacts to have um, to impact conflict and a, a range of other security factors. So we're thrilled to have with us today um, two very esteemed members of the um, U.S. and U.K. Um, militaries, um, retired and now um, out sharing with us their experiences and uh, more information about the security implications of climate change. Um, so I'll start with um, Lieutenant General Ken Eichmann um, down here at the end. Um, he's retired from the U.S. Air Force. He's the former um, commander of the Aeronautical Systems Center at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Um, he was also served as the commander of the Oklahoma City Air Logistics Center and installation commander at Tinker Air Force Base. Um, so he has a, just a wealth of experience from his engineering background and uh, his military background to with us today. He currently serves um, as the Deputy Director of the Center for Energy Security right here at home at University of Texas at Austin. Um, also with us today, Rural Admiral Neil Morissetti, um, who has uh, retired from the British Royal Navy um, after 37 years of service. Um, and his last active duty appointment was as the UK Government Climate and Energy Security Envoy. Um, he is uh, currently um, well, just last year, I suppose, in 2013, he served as the UK Foreign Secretary's Special Representative for Climate Change, um, working to help set political conditions for a uh, global agreement on climate change. So, um, without further ado, I will hand it over to them. To, uh, show you. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me back to the Strauss Centre. It's been some five years since I was last here. Quite a lot has changed, I think, but some of the underpinning pieces remain the same. You don't need to be majoring in international politics to know that the 21st century is proving pretty challenging. There are a number of threats to global stability <coughs> and our respective national security. Some of those are traditional. A manifestation of that is what's going on in Eastern Europe today um, and the risks associated with that. We've seen a, a, events and activity and actors in the Middle East. We've seen ISIS. We've seen what happened in Afghanistan, Iraq. But there are also some, what I would describe as some new or non-traditional threats to that uh, national security. Uh, and amongst those, I would include the impact of a changing climate. Be it as a result of the onset of the long-term trends, or <coughs> as a result of extreme weather events with which there are more, and to a degree more intense events than we've seen in the past. We're already seeing the physical changes resulting from changing climate, we're seeing, or, uh, we're seeing sea levels starting to rise, we're seeing temperatures starting to rise, and that's causing loss of land, we're seeing crop yields falling at a time when populations are growing, demand is growing, and we're starting to see the second and third order consequences. And by that I mean what happens when people lose their land <coughs> and their livelihood? Are they able to find alternatives which are legitimate, or are they being dragged into either on the, in the grey area or beyond that, and posing a threat. If, if they've lost their land, do they find something else? Can they move? Or as a piece of work in the UK uh, Government Office of, of, of Science, their foresight horizon scanning report showed, actually the biggest problem is not migration, it's trap populations. Those who cannot move and become more vulnerable, and, and there's a, a risk of increased tension in, as a result of that. We're also seeing quite a lot more academic work done in these areas showing that there is a, a link. And it's a link, particularly in parts of the world, where stresses already exist. Perhaps it's food shortages, it might be water shortages, it might be health problems, it might be population problems in the sense of growth, of or pace of growth of populations uh, beyond what the resources in the area can cope with. And frequently they're in the parts of the world where the government doesn't necessarily have the resilience and the capacity to look after their systems. And you see instability or you see conflict. And actually, work done by the UK Military Defence Development Conception Doctrine Centre in their 30 year horizon scanning shows a pretty good confluence between that and where we've seen conflict in the past and where we're likely to. And that's a belt that runs north and south of the equator right around the world. Well, we're going to pour petrol on that fire because that's where climate change is having its greatest effect, and it's having its effect on the river. Um, if you're here in Texas, or you're in the UK, or you're in Canada, or, or elsewhere in Europe, 
you might say, fine, okay, as a bit of a problem, we've got one about what USAID or Department of International Development or the equivalent are doing, but it's got nothing to do with us. Regrettably, that's not the case. Uh, as I'm sure many of you are aware, we live in a globalized world. What happens thousands of miles away affects us just as much as it affects those people. And it particularly affects nations like the UK and the US, trading nations. It affects us in three ways. We get raw materials from those parts of the world, or we use raw materials whose prices are affected by what's happening with the raw material supplies in those parts of the world, oil, for example. So there's volatility in the prices of, of our raw materials. Uh, oil at the moment, yes, it's $60 a barrel. It wasn't very long ago, it was $100 a barrel. It wasn't much before that, it was 120 And much of that was driven by what was going on in Syria and concerns about the um, Straits of Hormuz and whether that would cause problems. $20 on a barrel of oil for two quarters is half a percent of global GDP. Your economy is growing, the UK economy is growing. Europe would love half a percent of GDP growth. It's an issue. Similarly, we've seen disruption to the supply chains. Extreme weather events. Uh, 2011, floods in Thailand. UK car factories thought they were about to produce a brand new model, instead of which the workers went on a three-day working week. They couldn't get the components that were made in Thailand for Honda and Toyota and used in factories in the UK and elsewhere. Microchips weren't available for computers, it's all small stuff. No computers available in Orange County, California, Poland, or London. Those sort of shortages, those sort of interdependencies. And finally, there is an issue of the markets. As our economies grow, we come out of a recession, we're looking for new markets to sell the goods to. Those markets are invariably in the emerging powers. The emerging powers are in that belt I've just described. And if you've got an unstable market, it's unlikely you're going to be able to sell many products in there. So there's a risk there. So in other words, what I'm trying to say really, in a long-winded way is that the impact of a changing climate is affecting geopolitical stability, which in itself is not an end state. It's a prerequisite for economic growth, sustained economic growth, prosperity, and well-being. And it, that is one of the reasons that the military have looked at climate change, because national security is their business, or they want the action involved in national security. They looked at what the impact is, what the risk opposed, looking at climate change as a threat multiplier, a risk multiplier. They've looked what it means for missions and tasks, whether it be in capacity building, developing resilience in those countries, in which case they are a small part actor, and they're going to be working with a lot of our actors who are non-military. How are you going to do that? It's maybe waiting to get there on the day. They are looking at uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. Ultimately, they're looking at where they may find themselves deployed in conflict resolution, because it's posing a threat to those key natural resources that we require for our work. They're looking at what it means for the capabilities and you know, we may talk later about energy, the military and energy are, are largely done there. And, uh, but it can't be a military only problem. There is no security solution to climate change. There's just great risk of greater insecurity if you don't address it. And again, we might want to talk later on about how we address what is a 21st century challenge with 21st century solutions that affect all of government, affect the business community, affect all of society, and how you bring that all together to address this complex problem. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Neil. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I, I appreciate the opportunity, and uh, it's great, great to uh, do this at home. Uh, I was born and raised here in Austin, went to Travis High School, South Town, <coughs> came to UT, and I graduated, and spent uh, four years here and graduated with a degree in, in engineering, and went in the Air Force the next day. Spent over 35 years in uniform and came back to the university the next day after I retired. And currently I'm the deputy director of the Center for Energy Security here at the university. And it's interesting to note how that center got created. Uh, I came uh, back uh, to the university and, and was working in, in research here at the university. We got a call from the Pentagon. The Secretary of the Air Force uh, asked me if I would come uh, share some studies on energy for the National Academy of Sciences and the National Research Council. I did that, uh, very interesting. I, I thought I knew what the National Academy of Sciences was. I found out uh, it's a little different than I thought. 
uh, it was actually created by Abraham Lincoln when he was president, and uh, they're not subject to freedom of information or anything. You really want to do a study and not be worried about uh, any of the consequences. Just do the study. Nobody on the study is paid. Everybody does it pro bono, but they can get virtually anybody they want. Just give you a quick example. We, uh, in, in Department of Defense, any government agency can ask the National Academies to do a study for them. The National Academies will decide whether they think it's in the best interest of the nation to do that study. If they do, they'll do it. If not, they'll say, nah, we're not interested. So the question was asked by the Department of Defense, is the, is the United States investing enough in propulsion technology to maintain the technological lead over the rest of the world? Uh, if, it, if it is, uh, great. If not, we've got to do something about that because uh, if, if, if it's not, uh, the uh, airlines, everybody will buy whatever the best engine is because they've got to compete on a global basis. And that's balance of trade and, and uh, uh, all jobs in the U.S., all kinds of issues. And the U.S. military will buy the U.S., but if, they, uh, if that's not the best engine, we're going to be asking our warfighters to go to war without the best equipment, which is something we've never done and we don't want to start doing. So the National Academy said, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. So they put together a list of the top 200 propulsion technology experts in the nation. They narrowed that down to the top 20. And how they did that, I'm not sure. There were people who were on the original 200 list that weren't on the top 20 list that were very upset that they weren't asked to participate. But we had the chief engineer from, from, from Boeing, the chief uh, uh, engineer from, uh, from Pratt & Whitney and General Electric and Rolls-Royce and NASA and all kinds of people. And they asked me to chair this thing. And I wasn't sure why they did that, although I used to be in charge of research development for the Air Force and had done some PhD work in, in, in propulsion technology, but uh, still I, I wasn't at the level of propulsion technology these folks were. And I asked Dr. Bill Heiser, the Professor Emeritus of Air Force of Aerospace Studies at the Academy to come kick off the meeting. He's former Chief Scientist of the Air Force and Bill Heiser's a pretty quiet guy and he doesn't say much, but when he does, uh, everybody listens. Uh, so I asked him to kick it off and told him this is really an important study and he walked in the room and looked around the room like this and said, oh my goodness, he said, what's wrong? He said, Every engine flying in the United States today was designed by somebody in this room, military and commercial. Every textbook that teaches propulsion technology that I know of at any university in the world was written by somebody in your committee. I went, wow, now I really want to know what I'm doing here. <laughs> he said, well, getting this group to agree on what day of the week it is is going to be difficult. Getting them to concentrate on a specific topic for a study for several months is going to be almost impossible. We need somebody who can hurt cats, and you can hurt cats, so start hurting. Uh, but just give you a feel for the National Academy. So the National Academy then did a number of studies on environmental issues, on, on uh, energy issues. Uh, all those studies were out briefed to the Congress, to the White House, and to the Pentagon. Uh, and as a result of doing several of those studies, half a dozen or so that I shared, uh, I came back to the university and then was, was asked to be on the Military Advisory Board for CNA. Now, the Military Advisory Board for CNA, which Neil and I both serve on, uh, just finished a study on uh, uh, strategic national implications of, of uh, climate change. What does it mean to the security of our country and, and other countries? And uh, the, the CNA Military Advisory Board is, is a uh, group or panel of uh, senior uh, admirals and generals who study national security issues. We've studied a variety of them, the last one being the uh, linkage between uh, energy uh, uh, policies, uh, climate change, and national security. We're here to talk about that. But it gives you a feel of where we're coming from and what we're trying to do. Now, you know, we, we said, okay, do we believe in climate change? What's the data? What's the evidence? And we looked at all that data. We spent months studying this. Uh, and we, we found that, you know, 97% of the world's uh, climate scientists say climate change is real and a problem that needs to be addressed. They can differ, differ on the amount of, uh, of climate change and how much is man-made, but it's something we all need to address. And that conclusion, that's also the conclusion of the International Panel on Climate Change, the leading uh, international body for assessment of climate change. And it's endorsed by the World Meteorological Organization and the U.S. Environmental Program. And we found that pretty compelling for us. It says, we, we need to look at this. And the military looks at things a little bit different. You often hear climate change discussed from a political, political perspective. Uh, we look at it from a military perspective. And from a military perspective, we... Uh, we take a, a look at, uh, at the data, uh, we look for trends in the data, we correlate those trends, uh, we evaluate the source and quality of the data, filter it through our experience, and then recommend action based on that experience. And in, in fact, we never have 100% certainty on the battlefield. 
you wait for 100% certainty, something bad's going to happen. And so you, you base on, if 97% of the world scientists, we think there's enough evidence there, so we ought to take a hard look at this. We took a hard look at it. We came to several conclusions. One is that uh, we identified climate change as a threat multiplier for instable, uh, for instability in some of the most volatile regions of the world. And uh, Syria is a great example. I mean, clearly, uh, the droughts in Syria led to water shortages and, uh, sh and food price increases, shortage of food, uh, the, uh, the instability in the government, and as well as economic uh, uh, problems in the country that created an environment that allowed it to get to where it's at today. It didn't create the problems today, but it certainly uh, was a threat multiplier to help uh, uh, allow that to, to develop. We, uh, we found that projected climate change will add tensions even in stable regions of the world. And we can talk about some of those. We found that climate change poses a serious uh, threat to America's national security, and we believe that, and pointed out that climate change, national security, and energy dependence are a related set of global challenges. So we're, uh, we set out to address, to address those. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at some notes here with the opening statement and hearing we had this morning at 10 o'clock with the uh, uh, House uh, Foreign Trade and, and Government our, our committee, uh, but with, with all that in mind that I just said, uh, the Military Advisory Board studied climate change and concluded that climate change is indeed a national security issue. Uh, we know that it can exacerbate or be a catalyst for conflict. Uh, we know that stronger storms, droughts, and other climate-related national disasters make it likely that our troops will be sent in harm's way and stretch our resources. We know that. Uh, in fact, uh, we, there's all kinds of Problems. Uh, Neil talked about uh, natural disasters and how many of those are occurring in the 80s, the 10-year decade of the 80s. Uh, there were less than 400 natural disasters in the world per year. The last decade, there were over 800 per year. It's double. Uh, it's not just reporting. There are serious natural disasters. <coughs> and, and you know, you can talk about global warming. I'm glad that we went away from global warming to global climate change because some places are getting warmer and colder. It's a change in the environment. I know Boston's had a terrible year with snow, right? <laughs> My son and three grandkids live in Anchorage. They have no snow. There's very little. Their average snowfall is uh, 84 inches. They've had less than 17. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a change. So what does that mean? The waters are colder. There is more CO2 and, and other emissions in the environment. The ocean tries to equalize the CO2 in the air and the CO2 in the ocean. It becomes a heat sink, and so the oceans are warmer than they've ever been. And we're seeing uh, glacial melt. We're seeing that uh, the uh, Iceland or the uh, Greenland uh, uh, ice sheet is melting uh, today at six times the rate it was 10 years ago. Uh, and that becomes an issue as you get, you get sea level rise. The projections we heard this morning at the hearing, there was a uh, climatologist from NASA who reported that uh, sea levels will go up somewhere between two and four feet uh, in the next uh, few decades. Uh, two to four feet sea level rise is a real problem. Uh, in in uh, Miami, 25,000 homes are less than three feet above sea level. So it becomes issues. The military responds more and more to natural disasters around the world, and uh, those can exacerbate conflict and get us into all kinds of situations that uh, that aren't necessarily in, in our best interest, but for our military, but it's in the best interest of our, of our nation to respond. So we have to address those. Uh, the U.S. military is doing its best to tackle climate change. Uh, the Army is, uh, is making all kinds of changes in solar and wind and alternative natural renewable generation of power. The Air Force has certified all of its aircraft on synthetic fuels, which uh, can be used more of a single fuel for the battlefield, which has tremendous logistics advantages, as well as lower emissions. <coughs> uh, the uh, Marine Corps and the Navy are, are doing likewise. The U.S. Navy has uh, set a target of 40% of energy coming from alternative sources by 2020. And so if, if the military, with their jobs, can do what they're doing, uh, the rest of us, the, military, the civilian sector, can, can do so as well. Now, a lot's been done. We're on. I want to give credit for what's been done. A lot's been done, but not enough. And we don't have a coherent plan. We all work together in the same direction to pull it together. Uh, and and we, we get asked, and I get asked all the time, well, why should we do something? Others aren't doing anything. What's China doing? Well, China is, is starting to contribute. There's a, a world conference in Paris, uh, November I think it is, uh, and countries have been asked to contribute what they what they can do to help contribute to the, to the uh, 
emissions in the world and global climate change, and there have been some pretty dramatic uh, uh, statements, including by China, how much they're going to reduce their emissions. They've already stopped building coal plants, uh, and so there's a, there's a lot of things going on there that I think are going to be very helpful. Uh, <coughs> Texas, uh, if, and, and I thought it, if we were going to give, have a hearing with the Texas House, we ought to talk about Texas. Texas is clearly a leader in oil and gas, and has been, in, in, in power generation. It's also the largest uh, wind producer in America. I don't know if everybody knows that, but it is. In addition, Texas is a pioneer in energy efficiency, renewable energy technologies, as well as carbon capture and storage. In fact, uh, UT has uh, many of the contracts with EPA to do carbon capture and storage characteristics for the country. The, the potential of the state is, is boundless, especially when you consider that new global clean en energy investment increased 12% last year to $274 billion. And I think Texas is well positioned to compete in that marketplace. In fact, uh, the Con Street project, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, here in Austin, is a very innovative project that's providing valuable data to the nation on advanced energy management systems and, and all kinds of other energy efficiency uh, ideas that, that are generated from that project. Uh, the largest, most efficient microgrid in the country powers uh, the University of Texas, right here. And we're learning a lot uh, from that grid and how to make other grids more efficient uh, uh, around the country. So uh, I, I just uh, like to close by saying that responding to climate change by diversifying our energy supply and, and embracing efficiency uh, will help build a stronger, more prosperous state and nation and world. With that, let me open up for any questions. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we'll go ahead and open it up. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, uh, my question concerns efforts by the developed world to assist uh, developing countries in uh, combating the uh, impact of, uh, of climate change as outlined by the, by the Admiral, the negative impact there. Are you satisfied that the developed uh, world is advanced industrialized countries are doing enough. If not, what additional steps do you think uh, that we as uh, representatives of the industrialized world need to be taking to help uh, the poor countries, the less developed countries of the third world combat uh, climate change, mitigate its impact upon them? Thanks. Um, there's a lot going on. Whether it's the most effective use of resources, I would question. And by that I mean there's a lot of small activities going on. Um, yes, you've got the UN, United Nations climate change process and you've got commitments for $100 billion by 2020 from the developed world to the developing world. You've got various activities going on through um, national agencies, USAID, uh, the UK, DFID, and their equivalent <coughs> elsewhere. But I think it's, it, it, a lot of it is piecemeal and a lot of it, and I can be careful, I don't tar everything with the same brush. Here's the model. It worked there, we'll put it there, we'll put it there, we'll put it there. There is less of a partnership get, which going on, which there needs to be, between developing and developed countries, um, whether that's done on a bilateral basis, it's done on a regional basis, or whatever, to, to look at what is needed for that country to grow its economy. Because ultimately, that's what they need to achieve. Um, there used to be a standard joke, the answer to the coal-fired power station, what's the problem on energy? Well, the reality is, each one needs to be tailored. The process by which allow that country to develop its economy, and a lot of it's going to be about energy, because that's what you need to develop an economy, has got to be careful that it doesn't compound the problem of, of climate change. And the, the pressing need of, to, see, to, to get things sorted out may, mean, may be, have people rush into solutions which are in the short term very good, but in the longer term actually make our problem worse. Um, I also think there is more that needs to be done to help build that capacity and resilience countries can look after themselves. And a classic example of that is a couple of years ago, I was with uh, Pakistani water minister. And he said, I hope you're not going to propose to build me another water plant or a treatment plant. What I want is three places at Edinburgh University for some of my staff to study water management. And they can come back and then they can manage the water in Pakistan because they understand the conditions in Pakistan far better. So I think we've got to be a bit more imaginative. I think conversely, there are a number of developing countries who say, in Copenhagen, you promised $100 billion by 2020. And we think that should be government money. Well, you're not going to get $100 billion from government money. What you will get is some government money 
that pump crimes the system to allow the business community to be engaged in that process, which is a win-win in the sense that um, companies in America or companies in Europe can be engaged in the process, they can be working and making money, and we're, we're achieving what's going to be done in those countries. Now, I think things are getting better there. There is a more pragmatic approach, from, but there are still some developing countries who are being very purist <coughs> in, in their view. There are some developed countries who are very purist in what they're offering. So the answer is a bit more pragmatism and a bit more understanding the specifics of the country you're dealing with and using local knowledge. Thank you. General, uh, I value your background and I was pleased to hear you say that you personally poured through a bunch of data yep. early on. Two things have hit me in the last 24 hours and what I want to ask you is about your personal, not what somebody else said, but your personal assessment of this. The first is, in this weekend's Wall Street Journal, there was a featured article about the difficulty in measuring sea level and talking about what could be inaccuracies and so on and so on. The second is your statement 10 minutes ago about somebody prognosticated a two to four foot rise over some period of time. But my question is, is when you personally look at that, and we're all accustomed to, even with hurricane forecasts or whatever, they always say there's a 50% certainty of this, and a 75 of this, and a 90, or whatever, maybe statistical confidence factors. When you look at those data, what is your personal belief about the statistical accuracy of those forecasts? Okay. I'll, I'll tell you that uh, I was skeptical, and uh, two, three years ago, I didn't, I didn't believe it. I didn't believe what I just said. But uh, I knew there was enough evidence out there that I would look at it closer, and, and, I, and we took a closer look. And, and you get uh, 20 admirals and generals in a room, we don't agree on much, uh, but, but we're willing to look at things. Uh, and, and we get some very interesting exchange and, and, and discussions. We also have the ability at, at that level to, uh, to get people from almost any agency we want to talk to to come talk to us. Uh, and, and we can ask them exactly that kind of question. Why, why should we believe this? What's the accuracy of the data? What makes you believe this? Because you, you're right, it's the trends. But, you know, I mean, I mean it's the accuracy of weather forecasts and things. But when you look at it and you, and you find that 97% of the world's <coughs> climate scientists say, hey, this, this is happening. And, and uh, we're seeing, I mean, obviously we've had glaciers melt and grow and back and forth, but, but not to the level they're at now. Uh, for the first time uh, ever, the Arctic is going to be free of ice in a few years. In fact, they're transiting that Arctic now what they've never been able to do before without ice uh, The first uh, commercial shipping just went through the Arctic. Uh, and there, there are issues relative to what that means in terms of uh, sea level rise. Uh, and sea level, is it up eight inches, a foot, six inches? I don't know. It's up. It depends on how you measure it. In fact, it's up higher on the East Coast than the West Coast, and I'm told it's because of the Gulf Stream. I'm not an expert. On our board is uh, Admiral Titley, who is the former oceanographer of the, of the Navy, who uh, has much more insight into that data and, and what it means and what it doesn't mean. So we've looked at it from a lot of perspectives, and we've come to the conclusion, I've come to the personal conclusion, that, that it is real. How fast will it happen? Uh, how, how rapidly do we need to respond? I don't know, but what I think we need to do is have a, uh, an educated discussion about all the facts and all get on the same page so we can s develop some, uh, some plans. You know, in, in the military, we, we have contingency plans for everything. And we have a plan if North Korea comes across to, to militarize zone, what does South Korea do? What do we do in response? We have, we have war plans for every region of the world. Uh, the likelihood of that happening may not be very likely, but, but we, you know, we, we have a contingency plan. I think as a minimum, we need a contingency plan on how best to address climate change. And to do that, we're going to have to have a debate on what is the problem, how severe is the problem, and what can we do about it. And, and so I think we need to have that discussion. And people asked us earlier today uh, in a couple of press interviews, well, what do you, what do you hope to accomplish? You know, and of course, the ultimate thing is to make sure
make sure this doesn't happen or to keep it from getting worse or whatever. Uh, and, and, but the, the immediate challenge is to get the open discussion, the debate, and the issues, and so that people can make an informed, intelligent decision about uh, what to do about you know, what we believe is happening. And I think you know, at the end of the day, what we're talking about is risk management exercise in the sense that the scientists have taught us that two degrees of temperature rise from every pre industrial or 450 parts per million of CO2 is a manageable level of risk. Now we've got to judge how much we're prepared to invest to achieve that manageable level of risk. And what is clear is because of the pace of change and accelerating we don't have that much time. So we've got to judge what we've got to do in the way of adaptation and what's already in the system, and is in the system for the next 30 years, even if we stop emitting CO2 completely to date, we know it's impossible. And what we're going to do in the longer term. And to do that, that discussion that Sarah Lyke was talking about cannot just be about the threat or the challenge. It's got to be about the opportunity. Whether those opportunities sit in uh, energy, security, whether they sit in better health, <coughs> whether they sit in national security, economic growth and prosperity, or across the whole piece, we need to have that discussion, and we need to do our own analysis of what is, you know, what we're prepared to accept and what we're not, how much we think technology can do, and once you've had a complete discussion and you've used the same mainstream analysis tools that you've used for any other threat to your way of life, you're in a much better position to make informed judgments on what is appropriate. Let me ask a follow-up question there. So, of course, we know that aside from the biophysical impacts of climate change, climate change does not impact security directly. So we talk, as you all have noted, you know, about the various pathways um, from climate change impacts to security impacts. Um, what, from your perspectives, are perhaps the most advantageous places to intervene, either from a military perspective or <coughs> a policy perspective, on some of these different um, pathways between climate change impact and security? I think in the short term, it's about developing the capacity and resilience in those countries which are greatest risk because of not just climate change but all the other stresses, um, in order that they can look after their own and, and, and they can generate growth, they can generate um, prosperity and therefore people are less willing, less likely to want to move out of that country and cause pressure in other countries or less likely to be reduced the risk of conflict. In the longer term, we are not going to solve all of this in 2015. So you need a plan. And you need a plan which recognises that you need to drive down the greenhouse gas emissions. And to do that, you work on what the existing technology can allow us to do. You incentivise that. But at the same time, you are pushing the boundaries of science and technology. So what has been a real challenge with the economic downturn around the world is the first area of budget that gets hit is research and development. We need to restore funding to those areas so we can push the boundaries of technology, so we can establish the ways of, 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 of generating the quality of life we want because we've got the, the power, the energy, and everything else in the future without problems associated with, with emissions. study on information you know, security that I mentioned earlier, and we looked at, uh, you know, the first thing we do when we go to war with anybody is take out their power. I mean, I can't tell you the war plans, the classified lines, but everybody knows the first thing we do is take that enemy's power. Put them in the dark, limit their communications, uh, give ourselves a tactical advantage. Uh, so uh, it's not, I mean, 
the standard thing we do is, is to look at, uh, we have a capability, what if the enemy had exit? We have stealth aircraft, what if they had stealth aircraft? How would we find their aircraft? Well, we would use infrared, okay? And then, what if they used infrared? And then just take that down. So we get to the discussion on, on, uh, uh, on power, that uh, if, uh, if we take out their aircraft, what if they try to take out ours? How secure is our national grid? And it's not very secure. Uh, there, are, there, we have large uh, power plants uh, for good reason. Economies of scale reduce the cost of uh, utilities to the uh, to the customers, to the American citizen. But that requires step-down transformers, and those step-down transformers are put critical nodes in the in the grid. So how do you protect those things? Uh, there have been cyber attacks for years, which we've countered pretty well. But uh, more recently, there have been some physical attacks, including one in San Jose. Uh, and so uh, we got to think about those kind of things. Try and secure those uh, transformers, or, or how do we? Uh, <coughs> we don't have the manufacturing equipment in the country to manufacture those transformers today. We, we can recreate it pretty quickly, uh, but right now we would have to go overseas to, to secure some. We don't even have any in the national stack box. So one of the recommendations of our study was that we create that manufacturing capability, start replacing the older transformers on a on a slow basis. To start moving towards towards doing that. Now the other thing is to get rid of those nodes in the grid. Uh, so how do we how do we look at it? So we're looking at a lot of things. Uh, DOE likes SMR, small modular reactors. You know, I mean, uh, nobody wants to get to a Fukushima type thing, but but frankly, uh, the nuclear power plants in Japan didn't take some safeguards they could have taken to prevent what happened. I mean, South Texas nuclear project. Uh, uh, even if the generator room is underwater, it's a sealed room that's not, the generator's going to keep operating. We're not going to lose the plant, right, because they're there. Uh, but we're not supposed to large power plants, even nuclear. You know, uh, the plan is, let's not build a 100 megawatt plant, whether it's natural gas or coal or nuclear. Let's build like an SMR, small modular reactor, like our own aircraft carriers and submarines, which uh, are sealed units and can't melt down registry will call the walkaway safe, and we've been operating for over 50 years with never a failure of one. Uh, could, does it make sense? Could we put one on a, uh, you know, in a community to provide power for the community with zero emissions and, and uh, you don't need a large step-down transport instead of building a 1,400 megawatt power plant someplace, put seven of these SMRs in the ground and that will come together to the power, future power grid of the country. Don't know if that's the answer. It's an option. There are a lot of options. Natural gas is certainly better than coal in terms of emissions. Uh, so we're, we're looking at, uh, at, at all of those options. We're looking on, on, on our bases uh, in, in the surrounding communities. We used to look just at, just at the base, right? And everything inside the, the fence line was military area outside of somebody else didn't worry about that. We found that's not a good thing to do. Most people that work on the base and make it run on a daily basis live in the community. And so you got to support that as well. So we're looking at things from a, from a different perspective. And I think, uh, the Pecan Street project uh, is, is the modern community of the future, if you will, with more uh, hybrid or electric vehicles, more solar panels on roofs, more modern uh, uh, energy efficient homes. And it's, it's an area that I think was very smart for Austin to take the old airport and rather than just let it develop into a industrial <coughs> plant or something, put 700 of these homes there and, and instrument them to monitor them so we can find out things. And I'll tell you, uh, the U.S. is, is watching. Uh, I'd go as far enough to say the world is watching. It's, it's an interesting project, and I think it's yielding a lot of things that we can use for energy management systems or, uh, you know, all, all kinds of grids. The, the military bases have backup power. They have a limited amount of backup power, but most of it is hardwired to a given facility so that uh, if you have a longer duration outage and your priorities change, you can't reallocate the power. Why don't we, one of the recommendations was let's put a microgrid on the base and put all the backup power so we can reallocate it to different facilities as, as priorities change. We'll learn more about how to do that from Pecan Street than probably any other project around. So DOD is watching. There's lots of, but we need to do these things. We need to start doing some things that make some difference. Texas is, is leading in a lot of ways like that. So, so uh, your, your discussion in the military has primarily been at the, at the federal level. Um, at the state level, I'm, I'm sure that each state national guard uh, has has you know throughout the country have varying levels of acceptance or understanding of, of, of climate change. Um, you know, and, and, and at the 
you know, in Texas, of course, the State Guard will respond to hurricanes and other natural disasters. But I'm, I'm curious if there's the same or if there's any kind of trickle down, perhaps, from the federal to the National Guards to do some of the things that you've been talking about in terms of fuel, other capabilities, and that sort of thing. Yeah, and I, if there are any models, if there are any National Guards in any particular states that are models that other National Guards sure. might want to look at. I've had several of these dis same discussions we're having here with General Nichols, the Adjutant General of the State of Texas, uh, and Air Force Two Star, and uh, General Wizian, the Deputy for Air, and General Hamilton is Deputy for, for Brown. Uh, and in fact, I'm meeting with them again next week on this exact topic to make sure they're up to speed. We're looking at that things like port portable power for them. We talked about uh, uh, evacuation routes uh, for um, for hurricanes or natural disasters. You know, when Hurricane Ike hit, uh, hit Galveston and we evacuated Galveston and Houston, uh, they turned I-10 into, instead of three or four lanes into town, three or four out, to six or eight out, right? Everybody's going, nobody's going in, everybody's going out. Let's go out. But and when they say evacuate, and everybody hits the road, uh, a lot of the power is out, a lot of the cars aren't full of gas, you get somebody who's almost out of gas, they get on a road and they run out of gas, and they block it, and nobody goes anywhere. And so the National Guard was running up and down the side of the highway with Humvees with gas cans trying to fill up cars. There's got to be a better way to do this. Right? So I spoke at a conference a few months ago in Maryland, uh, at St. Mary's College of Maryland, and uh, the uh, environmental uh, policy chief of the state of Maryland was there, who used to be the assistant secretary of the Air Force for Energy, and uh, Paul Bollinger. And Paul uh, was talking about what they did in the state of Maryland, where after Superstorm Sandy and that part of the world, what they did was uh, uh, provide some state funding and incentives for uh, filling stations to have backup power in case the power grid went down. Filling stations along emergency evacuation routes are required to have backup power, and the state will reimburse a certain portion of their expenditures. Uh, so that made sense. Now they're getting a lot of kickback because they're putting diesel generators in, and environmentalists don't like the emissions from the diesel generators. So they asked us, uh, I got the folks here at the University of Texas involved, and we said, you know, these filling stations along emergency evacuation routes are through communities, typically, and there's natural gas to those homes. These diesel generators will run off of natural gas much cleaner than they will off diesel fuel. So let's take the generators and let's run them off of natural gas. And then if the natural gas line gets severed for whatever reason, we can always run off diesel as a, as a third uh, source. The other thing was said was you don't have to have backup power at every filling station. In fact, if you put the filling stations on a grid, you could have a backup power station at one filling station that supported five or ten along the route. So you don't need these everywhere. So we're trying to take the policies and procedures and put them into something that makes sense from a state perspective, uh, and we're sharing that with the Guard and Reserve as well. The UK is a small country, um, certainly compared to the United States, and therefore yeah, there's, there's an issue of scale, um, and the UK military is much smaller. What we're seeing is in the sense of all government departments were required by 2011 to produce a departmental adaptation plan to the forecast impact of, of climate change on the UK, the physical effects on the UK itself, as opposed to those international pieces I was talking about earlier, whether it's because of rising sea levels or whatever. What has come out of that is not just the vulnerability and the intentions to address that vulnerability, reduce the risks for those respective government departments, but what is that is, and I talked about 21st century solutions and 21st century challenges, you are getting better collaboration between departments. So for example, Defense, health, education have a lot of real estate. What one does probably works for the others as well. So there is, there is more work done on that basis, which is obviously more resource effective, and it allows you to, to learn from the other issues as well. So you've got the sort of immediacies of, of reacting to events, which, which you know, I can just talk about, and the piece that says, OK, what are we going to do to, to prevent the risk manifesting themselves? And there you have an opportunity to, to start to do this more collaborative approach in the way um, I have a question that shifts a little bit more toward human security and how this affects, you know, people who are going to essentially experience what happens if climate keeps changing. Um, you know, in, in a lot of these places where we're building capacity for governments in developing countries, it's not just the military, it's also the State Department. And so I'm wondering how, for both of your countries, like how are they linking up and are there 
um, capacity building measures for the civilian side of, say, for example, a military in a developing country going along with military and are the second and third order effects of those being looked at? You, yeah, 2011, the, the current coalition government used a document called Building Stability Overseas, um, signed by Defense, Foreign Affairs, and International Development, the three secretaries of state. And that did an analysis that looked at what were the factors that might cause instability overseas, and then it said, right, what are we going to do to try and help certain countries, priority countries, uh, reduce, reduce the problem? and a recognition that this was not just something for government. This is a new private sector engagement, it needed non-government organizations, some of them have been in, in those countries for many years, um, and it clearly needed the governments of those countries to be involved in, 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 in the policy. Um, end of term report. Yeah, we did some things quite well, there's a lot more we could do. Um, partly because the three sectors of state all changed, priorities change. Um, also, I think there's a piece of people trying to understand, okay, so who does what? And I think in that sort of circumstances, the military is actually a very small actor. It might be, for example, in border security. It might be in managing the exclusive economic zone, the 200 miles from the coast offshore, and the resources there. And we've seen examples of where, because of climate change, fish stocks have moved or been deployed in, depleted in some countries, so the fishermen of those countries have moved across and started to take fish out of another country's EEZ because that country didn't have a coast guard or anything to manage that. So that sort of side of things can be done. But a lot of it is about tax, it's about legal, it's about all the other bits which fall to either other government departments or to, um, to, to the non-government. And that in itself is a challenge because that makes it a pretty complex problem. You've got to bring a lot of actors together, find a common language, uh, a common understanding, of what the priorities are um, and how you take it forward, and resources as well. Um, let me add to that. Uh, I, I think, you know, I mentioned earlier <coughs> SMR, uh, we find more government agencies working together. The DOD and DOE signed a uh, uh, energy security MOU recently where they said we need to work together to solve energy security problems in this country. DOE and DOD, not just for DOD, but for the country. And uh, one of the elements in there, just one of them, and I don't want to overstate the SMR thing, it may never get there, it's, it's an option. But just that one, they said, we need to build a business case for SMRs on military installations. That would provide power, not just for installations, but for the supporting community as well. And the reason you put on military installation is for security of the reactor, you don't want these everywhere. Uh, so, but they're, they're talking about working together. Now the State Department, and DOD uh, and other agencies <coughs> are, are working together. I know recently uh, we were talking about uh, India, the largest democracy in the world, <coughs> that the U.S., right? and, and we need to be better coordinated with, with what they're doing and trying to help them uh, to help us uh, in, in the world. Uh, and we were thinking, how do, how do we do that? And we wanted to get the U.S. military and the Indian military together to do an exercise. Neither military was really excited about that. <coughs> yeah, I don't think so. so. We said, well, all right, how are we going to how are we going to do this? And to get the countries to work together, uh, we thought let's get let's let's do it from the business perspective. Let's get CEOs of big companies in India with CEOs of big companies in the United States and talk together about mutual benefits, those kind of things. And so they created this CEO panel or, or whatever it was called. It was a panel. It was a CEO. And it was chaired by Ratan Tata from India. Now, I don't know Mr. Tata, but Tata uh, is probably uh, Bill Gates and Dura Motors and a few other places put together. 220,000 employees. He owns Tata Automobiles, Tata Airlines, Tata. <coughs> uh, and he chaired this thing. And a lot of prominent U.S. CEOs. And they got to decide how we could, how we could help each other. And something came up that he wanted help with uh, improving uh, aircraft safety. They were losing too many airplanes. It started with military airline, but most, you'd be surprised, maybe you wouldn't be, how many airline pilots are actually military pilots. I mean, it's very expensive to train a pilot. So the military spends a year or 18 months training a pilot to give them four years of flying experience, and uh, 
the airlines who make them a great offer to go train another one, right? So, um, <laughs> it's, my son's one of those. I know. <laughs> uh, so, so uh, he was saying we, we have this 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 problem, and it's sort of like uh, you know getting the military to work together. My brother and I used to fight all the time until somebody picked neither one of us, and the two of us would go get him, right? I, so let's find a common issue. Nobody wants. Maybe the U.S. military and the Indian and military aren't close friends or working together very closely, but nobody wants pilots to die. We don't. So we seldom, if ever, lose a pilot because of uh, poor training. Uh, something goes wrong with the airplane, but typically it's not just pilot error. There's enough backup systems and, and enough safeguards and those kind of things. So uh, rather than send somebody in military uniform to India, they, they ask if I would go to, to represent the United States and, and have some military background. And uh, I met with Mr. Tata, and I told him I wanted to meet with his military training leaders. He arranged a meeting the next day of every general officer in Indian Air Force. I asked him how he did that. He said, in five years, they're all going to work for me. So. <laughs> <laughs> however you do that, that's, that's good. So, so I met with him, and uh, uh, I invited him to come and fly with the U.S. Air Force. <laughs> and we sent some advisors over to, to train their pilots. They were taken from a, a Cessna-type airplane to a MiG-29 or something. It's too big of a leap. You got to have something in between intermediate yeah. training. Whoa, you're getting way behind the power curve here, and, and you get out, get in trouble. And that's where they were going. And then these guys who had problems, weren't properly trained, were going to the airline. And it was, it was, so we were able to help. Now we've got some mutual respect about. Wow, they value our opinion, and you know, and, and we're, we're trying to work this thing to get closer. We've got to find ways we can work together. Where we can work together on climate change. You know, I, I was part of something in the Pacific called PESOLs. Pacific Area Senior Officer Logistics Seminar. To be, a, to be invited to a PESOLS conference, you had to be the Director of Logistics for a country that bordered the Pacific Ocean. That is a lot of countries. Right? But we actually got Pakistan and India sitting down working on, on climate issues because of PESOLS. They would you know, like each other. We put them on the same panel. And we, we, were, we got a common enemy they could, they could address, environmental issues. Right? Cleaning up the Pacific. We still have people in Guadalcanal and Beautiful islands out there, the Sol Solomon Islands, where they'll have a uh, go out on the beach and start a fire at night on the beach, right? And a, and a grenade blows up or, or, or weapon, uh, uh, an unexploded shell that's still in the beach buried under the sands. So we actually got all these countries together to say, how do we clean up the beaches from World War II? How do we do that? What's the best way to do that? Everybody wants to do that. So nobody's got a problem with doing that. We've got to find these mutual issues. I think climate change can be one of those issues. And it needs to be addressed. Um, are you looking into climate engineering, like aerosol injecting as a sort of risk management tool? Or is that? Well, the great, the yeah. elephant in the room that no one talks about. <laughs> <laughs> and the reality is, you do need to talk about it. Yeah. There needs to be discussion. There needs to be agreement protocols. Some framing to allow some of that experimentation to go on. I mean, some of it is very minor. Some of it is completely different. You know, and if, if you don't, a lot of people say, well, I've read, I've read Super Freakonomics. I'll just stick a pipe up in the sky and pump stuff up, and that solves the problem. Um, and it won't affect anyone else, and we just get everything sorted out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, funny old thing. And there's some Olympics, didn't it, 2008? Um, <laughs> but the point is that there is some evidence of geoengineering, painting your rooms a different color, this sort of thing. You know, which are very positive. But it's all been tarred with the same brush, and we're not having that discussion. And I think actually you're better in this country on it than we, than we are in Europe. It gets very emotional if you mention geoengineering in Europe, and it gets emotional very quickly. There needs to be a, a cool a cool look at this. I say, right, how are we going to do this? Otherwise, I mean, the British government found themselves caught out three or four years ago. Because somebody who happened to work for the British government was doing geoengineering. And the headline was, British government's doing geoengineering. <laughs> Are we? You don't tell me. Um, so, that, yeah, that's, a, that's what I think we, we need to We do need to address these issues. We do need to see where there, is, there there'll be some benefits that can be accrued with, with minimal to no risk at all. There's other things which are potentially very dangerous, or we just don't know what's going to happen. And that needs to be addressed.
So there's been a lot of talk about collaboration between government and different departments. But what about collaboration between the government and the media? I feel like a lot of just the public doesn't really understand the, the, the statistics that the media that the media is throwing at them. Ninety-seven percent of scientists agree climate change is global. Why isn't it a hundred? Um, in the scientific community, ninety-seven is, is as good as it's gonna ever get. Um, so what about that? Um, what about that? Like, what same thing with two degrees Celsius, right? In, in America, what does two degrees Celsius really mean? <laughs> it's, it's Fahrenheit, right? Um, so how how can we collaborate with the media to be able to portray these statistics better to the public? Um, yeah, and I'm guilty because I said two degrees. <laughs> <laughs> we have, there is not a narrative. We need a st it's not a narrative, it's a story. Yeah. In other words, it's a word people can understand. 97% of the scientists, why isn't it 100%? Why not use the example, it's 97 doctors out of 100 doctors told you there's something wrong. As much as you'd like to believe the other three, <laughs> the chances are, if you're a sensible person, you'll go with the 97. The story has to be told by storytellers who the audience can relate to, in a language the audience can understand, <coughs> using examples that resonate with them. And we are not good at that. I don't think any country is good at it, to be honest. And, and it's no good. The story that's told in the UN General Assembly is absolutely useless in a village in Africa, Asia, or Texas. I, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, I, I, I think, uh, and, and that's part of what we're trying to do. I mean, we're, we're not paid by CNA. We cover our expenses at the back. I mean, we, we're, tr we're trying to get the word out because we think it's an important thing to do. Uh, I work for the Center of Energy and Security here pro bono for the university because I think it's important. My wife gives me a fucking retirement, but I enjoy what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, but, but I think uh, if we can get out, now fortunately today we've had, what, six media interviews or something like that? If we can get the word out, we can get people listening, people talking about the issue, maybe we can change some of those things. Uh, I can't tell you how many times today some reporter said, I didn't, I didn't realize that. Never heard of that. Oh, wow, that's interesting. It really is a national security impact. So, you know, so uh, the more we can get the word out now, we're not going to change it by ourselves, but there's a lot of them on the Filter Advisory Board. And we talk to you, you talk to somebody else. We've got to get the word out. We've got to get the media involved. I, I couldn't agree with You know, I, I had a war story I got to tell you. We were talking about uh, press in, in, in the UK. Uh, when I took over command of Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, they were building a new. Uh, we were expanding base housing, building a new fire station on that part of the base where the new houses were going to be. And they were digging a trench for the water lines or something, and they went clank, clank, and hit something. And when they uh, they pulled away, there was it was a biological weapon. Whoa! What do we have here? And so we checked all the records. There is no record of a biological weapon ever being at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. In fact, we just signed a treaty with the Soviet Union where they disclosed disclosed wherever every place that they'd ever had them. We disclosed every place we've ever had, right? Never used one, disclosed where we had them, destroyed them all, but but where were they? <coughs> right, Patterson wasn't on that list. So I got a lot of attention from the Pentagon, right? <laughs> so we start saying, what do we got here? So we start bringing in metal detectors and sorting around, and we find more of them buried, and we start digging, well, what is this? And uh, we found 2,300 uh, bio chemical biological weapons and we, we didn't know what we had. We know what we were, how they got there. And so the, the media called a press conference because people were going to get out. You know, we need to tell people what we found and we're, we're investigating it. And said, so, well, what's the worst it could be? I said, Geez, I don't know. Uh, what, what is the worst it could possibly be? What, what could it possibly be? The worst it could possibly be is anthrax. Right? Now, we didn't have anthrax weapons, but we don't know where these came from. That's the worst it could be. So, but we don't think it is dead. We think it's fine. We're going to find out what it is. Next day, headlines, Dayton Daily News, anthrax found on right Patterson. <laughs> oh, everybody calm down. And the press conference real fast, right? So I found out it was a Priscilla Seuss virus, which was like the flu. And so if, uh, if back, back in the 50s, 60s, uh, the Russians come through the Fulda Gap, Germany, right? We're going we're gonna to consider dropping these weapons on them, give them the flu, give them the fever. And, and uh, some virus, they're going to feel terrible. They're not going to feel like fighting. Serious, it was a, it was a concept. So we were, we were experimenting with this. And then we found this out later in that 
These were all destroyed in the 70s in terms of uh, sterilized weapons, buried in a remote part of the base. It was called Operation White Cloud. You know, we finally found an old gentleman who had retired 40 years earlier from the base who remembered something about Operation White Cloud. So we put out, a, anybody know anything about Operation White Cloud? Nobody knew anything. About two weeks later, we got a box from uh, the Defense Logistics Agency, Richmond, Virginia, that had a box that said Operation White Cloud on it. No address, didn't know where, where to send it. It was being sent to the Air Force Records Repository in St. Louis, which burned down in 1984, and all records destroyed. Fortunately, this box didn't get there. Because we looked in the box and it said, here's what we did. Some of these weapons were blue, some were brown, some were green, and they were all made at Anniston Army Depot in Alabama, and they were, some were shipped by train, some by plane, some by truck, and heat and different environmental controls, how much of the virus survived for how long when it got the right path, they were all tested and then they were sterilized, and that was all in the records. There were 2,300 of them, thank God. <laughs> I didn't want one extra, and then one went short. <laughs> and, and, but, but we found out what it was, and we were able to talk to the press, but, but the press got things stirred up way more than we needed to before we ever got started. There, you know, and we got to get the press involved to present the full story. They can be skeptical. 97% of them support us, that's fine. You know, but <laughs> we need to have this debate, and the press has got to to, uh, to uh, present the facts, and not their interpretation. That's not like worse than a reporter saying what so and so meant to say was. That's not what he said. I heard him say it. Right? So just give me the facts. But there's some other people who've got to get to as well. You've got to get farmers to talk to farmers. You've got to get village elders to talk to their village. You've got to get GPs, general practitioners, doctors who are really good at taking complex science in the medical world and explaining it in a 10 minute discussion in a, a surgery to someone who may, you know, may or may not have a serious disease. And we've got to encourage those groups. We've got to encourage faith leaders, faith communities, to engage in that dialogue. In other words, this is not an environmental niche issue. This is a mainstream issue that needs to be treated like all other mainstream issues. And all the tools you use to address mainstream issues you want to apply to climate change. chaired by Bill Gates, uh, Norm Augustine, uh, former chairman, CEO of uh, Lockheed Martin, uh, uh, Chad Holliday, CEO of DuPont, uh, retired uh, president of Bank of America, Jeff Immelt, president of, uh, CEO of GE, and three others. Uh, it's an interesting group who have uh, written an energy, <laughs> energy plan, a business energy plan for America from a business perspective. Not about how, what's good for my company or your company, but what's good for America. It's an interesting perspective. Uh, you, you might Google that and go, go read their business. That's about 30 pages or so, but it's, it's an interesting thing. We, we at, at the Military Advisory Board had uh, uh, Chad Holliday and Norm Augustine come talk to us at one of our meetings and talk to us about their concerns and what they think the issues are and where we should go. But, but that's the kind of involvement <coughs> we need from business leaders because a lot of those people will listen to them. And they may or may not listen to the military. I think the military has some perspective as well that, that, that we have some credibility that people will listen to us. But from a business perspective, they listen to those guys. So if we can go with them, and, and uh, uh, I've been trying to set up a, a panel discussion in Washington with members of Congress, the Secretary of Energy, Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, uh, Chad Holliday, Bill Gates, uh, some of these folks, and talk this issue. I think, it, I think we need a national debate on this issue. I haven't been able to pull that off yet, but I'm working on it. 
and I got the president of the university to sign a letter inviting them all. Uh, I haven't said it yet because I'm waiting to see a couple other things for inputs, but uh, I, I've talked to the as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Operational Energy, Kirk Schoenberg, and, and her office. Uh, she just recently left that office, but talked to them about, you know, as soon as this letter comes from Secretary of Defense, it's going to go down to your office, the Secretary for Energy, and you need to tell him he needs to come. Sharon, before he gets the letter, let me tell you something. If, if he comes, Secretary of Energy will come. Secretary of Energy and Secretary of Defense come, Secretary of State will come. And we, if none of the first one doesn't come, nobody else is going to come. We've we got to have this debate. We need an energy strategy for America, which is going to address global climate change as well, and we don't have one yet. We've got elements of it, but too many people are doing their own thing. They're trying to do the right thing, but it's not coordinated. Uh, and certainly we're not coordinating with the world. We're, we're, we're working with the UK and all kinds of other countries, and, and we're really pleased to have, have Neil on the military advisory board because it gives us a different perspective uh, from us, but, but we're trying to get some of these things uh, to work so we can get that debate started. But you're right, it needs to happen. Yeah, I think, I know just what you're talking about with some of these studies, which you know, would be dubious if you tried to flog them in a peer-reviewed academic journal, and I think you'll be prepared to challenge them. Let's see your assumptions. Um, and do it in, in, you know, in a constructive fashion, and don't selectively dine like the counter-argument you may often find is, in, for example, when those who are skeptical or don't believe that there's a need for action, um, with, 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 with things like UNF, C work, or the IPCC, <coughs> Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Reports, um, so it's all right, show me what your assumptions are. And bring in, in your analysis, people who can say, no, that's a flawed assumption. And then say, right, are you going to put your hand up? If not, we will. We'll write a letter to the editor of Senator. This paper is full. So, um, there's a laureate from Canada. His name is Joe Stiglitz. Famous for publicly pointing out that economics is not a science. And the reason it's not a science is because it's not predictive. Modern economics, you know, hedge funds hire a lot of uh, quantitative physicists because they can do the mathematics. We have big data everywhere now being sold. And big data has the ability to provide us with a lot of. Modeling. But it also what it also produces, and we're dealing with this biodiversity right now, it, it, it produces an enormous number of anthrays that don't know. So we have the problem of sorting through big data. Given all of that, and, and what we can juice out of that, particularly with regard to energy <coughs> industry society and how that sets up, you know, social dynamics and power structures and technology. Beings. I'm curious, our models of cultural dynamics and cultural change, our models of adaptation of the human population also feed back into this whole idea. And I'm curious what's being done, particularly since we're looking at ever-increasing populations, ever-increasing stress, on a particular geographic location, and we're and we're trying to, and, and you mentioned this being sort of a hodgepodge thing. It appears if we look back in, in time evolutionarily, the adaptation of human populations and pre-human populations has always pretty much been a hodgepodge kind of thing. So where's what where's where's the effort, the investment, in the whole process of this idea of, of human adaptation, human ecology? adaptation, social adaptation to all the, uh, the technology and the problems. I mean, we're pretty much stuck, as I see it, with what we've already created in terms of climate change. So we're, what, what, what investment is being made in looking at this problem of human adaptation for very large populations in, in specific areas? I think you touched on one of the real issues that it's only now that we're starting, and it is starting, there's no more than that, to get a degree of accuracy over, over specific areas. 
and, specific, and understanding specific communities. Because one community can react completely differently to another one a few hundred miles away for the same problem. And I think the challenge is, is the need to make the investment in the time and money to do that analysis in the same way that, for example, the UK uh, Meteorological Office has invested huge sums of money in a new computer so they can talk about what the, what the forecast, not just of the weather, but for climate change, for small squares on a grid, not just a large, you know, that's the UK, that's Europe, etc. cetera. Um, and we need to make that investment. So that what is, in a particular context of adaptation, what is done is tailored to the needs and the strengths and the weaknesses of the communities that, you, that has been addressed, if you follow me. And to do that, you've got to have sufficient confidence that this is an important enough issue to make that investment. Which comes back um, to Ken's point about the need to have that discussion, to have that informed discussion. So, you know, there is a reason why we're doing this. It's not just to keep some boys employed or something like that. Well, we're coming to the end of our time here, so I hope that you all will um, join me in thanking General Eichmann and then more.